Hello and welcome to this webinar, Your Gut and Your Immune System. I'm Miguel Trevio Mateas, Director of Research and Innovation and Head of Education at Atlas Biomed. So today I'm talking about the gut and the immune system, the relationship between the two. It's a fascinating subject that I hope you're going to find really useful to delve into. And before we do that, I wanted to introduce myself. I am I'm Miguel, Miguel Torivio Mateas, the Director of Research and Innovation and Head of Education at Atlas Biomed. I'm a clinical neuroscientist and nutritionist. I've uh, been working with Atlas for a little while now, and uh, I am very excited to share with you today the objectives of the session, which are to learn about immunity, some aspects of immunity that probably you didn't know before. So I hope to uh, uh, pick your interest around this subject. Explore the role that the gut microbiota or your gut microbes actually have in immunity. Explore the role of some substances like lipopolysaccharides or LPS have in regulated immunity and how your gut microbes are actually involved in this uh, regulation and also a very special announcement that i'm going to keep that until the end of the session if i may so um, very excited about a couple of things that i wanted to share with you so before uh, uh anything else let's go with number one so learn about immunity and uh we're going to go a little bit uh, to the past before we go uh to explore immunity today so what is immunity at the end of the day so where does the the word immunity come from it comes from the latin immunis that actually meant to be exempt from work uh, and public service uh, uh, if you were uh, in the upper classes of the roman empire so um it's uh, uh an interesting origin of the word actually because it it almost means not have to uh, um, uh, rub shoulders with those who were in the lower classes in those days, who obviously had more susceptibility to disease. So uh, that's the that's the origin of the word. Uh, in terms of the early discoveries around uh, immunity that are worth mentioning, as far back as the 18th century, microbiologists were trying to inoculate people. Um, which is a very topical subject now with the pandemic, um, but it goes back to um, over 200 years where um, um, more rudimentary kind of vaccines were actually being manufactured, uh, trying to uh, protect us from various different diseases. And some of uh, the uh, key scientists that actually uh, um, were working in this field uh, are worth mentioning. One of them is uh, this um, um, scientist called Eli Mechnikov, who um, discovered what we know today as innate immunity. And uh, he described also um, uh, certain types of cells like phagocytes, for example, which are the um, um, certain cells in the immune system that um, um, envelop uh, particles uh, that might be um, uh, causing trouble to, in, to the immune system and, and eliciting a, a response from your immune system, as well as um, 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 clean up the, the mess that is actually left behind from the, the work of other cells like uh, uh, natural kill cells, uh, neutrophils, basophils, and, and so on. So uh, a very interesting um, um, discovery. And he didn't just discover uh, innate immunity and described the role of uh, uh, phagocytes or macrophages. He uh, also discovered probiotics the way we know them today. So that's the link between that uh, Eli uh, Mechnikov's uh, work and, and some um, more recent present um, um, subjects that we talk about today. So if we look at yogurts and kefir you'll know i'm a big proponent of uh, fermented foods and uh, i love kefir and it has a number of different uh, microbes including lactobacillus acidophilus saccharomyces boulardii and uh, other saccharomyces uh, um, um, probiotic yeast as well as bifidobacterium uh, um, uh, infantes and other types as well 
that is uh, a really interesting combination of uh, microbes that are in fermented dairy. And uh, Mechnikov was actually looking into how people from the Caucasus mountains had access to this um, really interesting health giving probiotic uh, microbes through uh, fermented uh, dairy. So thank you Mechnikov for that discovery because it's actually allowed us to enjoy uh, kefir and yogurt today knowing that it's actually doing a, a lot doing us a lot of good and part of uh, Mechnikov's uh, work the work on innate immunity as the the older uh, arm of the immune system that is uh, uh, composed of barriers like the skin and small molecules as well as cells like the macrophages and dendritic cells is really interesting and really relevant today and very interesting for the gut particularly, and we'll take a look at that in a short while, but we have uh, a differentiation thanks to his work uh, um, between what is innate immunity and adaptive immunity that we'll be describing in a little bit more detail as well as we go through the presentation. And today the terms that we use to refer to these two um, uh, sections of the immune system, so to speak, are cell-mediated immunity and adaptive immunity. And uh, the immune system resides in a, a number of locations around the body. So uh, you have a, a network of, uh, um, of immune organs that we can see um, uh, right now. So the tonsils, the uh, lymph nodes, the spleen, liver, the payers patches, very important role um, in the immune system located in the gut. Uh, and we obviously have the bone marrow, which is where uh, the location where all the cells um, for, from the immune system actually originate from. So while all cells in the blood originate from the same precursor stem cells in the bone marrow, the places where they mature and end up living actually vary. And uh, if we look at where the cells in the immune system live, we have lymphocytes, for example, that live in the uh, lymph nodes uh, and the spleen and the pays patches, as well as uh, the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or malt, which is a very important type of tissue because it's, uh, um, it's, uh, it contains uh, another very important uh, a structure called the gut associated lymphoid tissue or gout which is the main component of this malt so gout is located in the gut and malt is uh, a wider than the gut and is a, a wider network of uh, immune tissue but the fact that the gut is so important is uh, based around the the large percentage of immunity that is located in the gut. So the gut associated lymphoid tissue makes up around 70% of the whole of the immune system, which is um, uh, incredibly important. And you can understand why if your gut is compromised, you're likely to also compromise the immune system as a whole, which is also uh, why we need to look at the gut not just as a tube that allows us to process food, but also as an immune interface. And that's kind of, uh, we're getting into uh, the, the nitty gritty of, of the kind of uh, subject that I wanted uh, to share with you today. I hope that you enjoyed that introduction, uh, a brief introduction of immunity and some interesting uh, facts around uh, the history of immunity and so on. So let's have a look at the gut uh, from this perspective. And we do know that the gut is a, a, a really uh, large organ uh, that goes from, you know, you could start talking about the gastrointestinal tract really from the mouth all the way down to the anus. But we look at the main organs of digestion as the stomach, the small intestine and the colon with different um, and structures, you know, you have the stomach and the duodenum, you also have the jejunum and ileum, as well as the colon or, or the, the large bowel. And each of those will have their own uh, makeup, their own diversity of flora, and not, yes, not just uh, bacteria, but also yeast and, and um, protozoa. So, you know, you're looking at uh, um, even like 
little parasites living there as part of normal life. And uh, the curious thing about the colon is that it harbors the largest number of uh, um, microbes in the whole of the um, gastrointestinal system. So you have billions as opposed to tens of thousands uh, and a larger diversity as well as you can see uh, right now in the video. So if we look particularly at the physiology of the gut lining, which is very important in terms of the gut as an immune interface, we have uh, the uh, intestinal epithelial cells, and uh, that is the, the one layer, just one layer of cells that the gut lining or the skin of the gut is actually made up uh, from. So it's, it's just literally just one line like one brick after another, but not like different layers of bricks, just one layer of bricks, one after the next, with a little junction in between each of those, um, which is called uh, a tight junction, actually, or a gap junction. And on top of that, you have some mucus, and the mucus will have different layers. So you have the inner mucus and the uh, outer mucus, and the outer mucus is uh, uh, a more fluid, and the inner mucus is thicker and less penetrable by uh, microbes than the outer mucus that harbors um, a, a whole um, 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 selection of different microbes, including things like acromantia, mucinifila, for example, and so on. So what does it do? What, that, what is the purpose of having the, the mucosal um, lining, this, this layer of mucus on top of the um, um, intestinal epithelial cells? Well, it's a, it's a complex chemical barrier. It's not just mucus, I think, like, you know, a little bit uh, similar to when you blow your nose. Uh, it, it does carry some similarity, but it, it also uh, plays a role in immunity because immune cells are actually uh, a part of this mucus. They are actually embedded in this mucus and, uh, and it will help uh, the body to draw from the different functions of different immune cells to fight against uh, external substances that might actually aggravate you for some reason. Uh, um, uh, internal or external toxins that might actually cause a problem locally in the gut. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have a look at these kind of uh, situations as we go through the uh, presentation. So what is very important as well is the, the fact that your, your gut bacteria actually shape your gut immune response. So taking that into account again, that you know your uh, uh, gut uh, has around 70% of the whole of the immune system is located in the gut, and that's gut-associated lymphoid tissue, so that GOLD. Uh, so if you take that into account, then there's a huge number of bacteria um, are living in the uh, intestine, uh, particularly in the uh, large um, intestine, so the colon. And uh, according to what they produce, uh, and this is very, very important, they're going to um, um, modify your immune response. So uh, uh, we have a, a, a quick introduction to that in this very busy uh, uh, image that you see in there. But you start seeing things that you might recognize. So you see mucus production. You see SCFAs, which are short, short chain fatty acids that we're going to be talking about in, um, in a moment. Um, and you see uh, uh, Bacillus fragilis in there that is uh, producing something interesting that is affecting the gut. You see the paste patches and so on. Let's break this down a little bit and actually uh, look into what might be uh, the interesting agents that are uh, or, um, actors in, in this kind of like theater that is the gut. So you, we have uh, LPS producers. What is LPS? We have such a thing uh, as lipopolysaccharides. And if you break that down into little um, short um, um, syllables, you have the lipo, which is fatty or fat, or lipid, and you have the uh, polysaccharide. So polysaccharide is basically, poly is uh, many, saccharide is sugar. This is a complex sugar attached to a, a little bit of fat. And this is a completely natural structure that is found attached to the membrane of uh, gram-negative bacteria. And 
And this is very important because we have a lot of those in the body, some of them more inoffensive than others, but we have things like uh, Campylobacter, which is, you know, a, uh, a, um, a, a culprit in kind of like, you know, a, a food um, uh, toxicity. So, you know, food poisoning, um, uncooked meat and, and, and so on. Cytobacter, um, uh, potentially the same kind of thing. Klebsiella, which is um, um, airborne and uh, um, types of Klebsiella are culprit uh, behind the, the your pneumonia kind of infection. And if you have Klebsiella in the gut, and uh, it happens to be the same Klebsiella that would give you in, um, pneumonia, it doesn't mean that you will get pneumonia from having that in the gut, but it's also not ideal to have large amounts of Klebsiella pneumonia in the gut because it's going to be producing uh, LPS, which is not an ideal molecule. And again, it's not um, uh, something that we need to think as the absolute enemy and that needs to be uh, gotten rid of um, completely because as everything in life, that will not happen very easily. But you also need to be aware of the science behind uh, lipopolysaccharide and the fact that it's actually associated with uh, um, uh, an immune response or an inhibition of an immune response and with inflammation, which also leads us nicely to why we're talking about this, because Atlas has a really nice inflammation report that we're going to be covering in the session today as well. And uh, there's plenty of science actually describing the, the uh, fact that certain types of bacteria which are um, abundant in your gut and they don't have the the air of uh, um, uh, opportunistic or pathogenic bacteria that maybe the Klebsiella or the Cytobacter might have. So we're talking about um, Bacteroides, a large um, um, community of, of, uh, of uh, microbes, very varied community of uh, microbes that are part of your, of your normal, your commensal gut bacteria. And uh, they do carry um, like polysaccharide because they are um, um, gram-negative bacteria which happen to carry that molecule in their membrane. So they're going to elicit a response by the immune system every time that they kind of like go a little bit out of whack or they, they grow too much. They're going to a state of overgrowth. So we do know from um, uh, many other sessions that uh, uh, you will have heard me speak at or, you know, um, uh, social media posts or uh, whoever else you, you follow, because this is all news now, diversity and, and this biosis kind of thing, you know, it's, it, I'm not um, um, revealing anything new here. So everybody uh, has an idea that diversity is really important uh, when it comes to gut microbes. The diversity of your gut flora is incredibly uh, important and it will be associated with a better uh, um, uh, possibilities of, of remaining healthy or uh, um, lesser chance of developing a severe condition if you happen to, to be ill. So, uh, diversity is great, is what you want to have. A lower diversity is associated absolutely with the opposite. So worse off um, health outcomes, worse off health overall, and more risk of developing uh, conditions. And, uh, uh, and they range from inflammatory conditions that are localized in the gut to autoimmune conditions, to allergy, neurological disorders, and so on. So. Um, the, the opposite spectrum of that diversity and harmony that we could find potentially in um, and around the Mediterranean with Mediterranean diets being uh, uh, championed by scientists around the world as being potentially one of the, the best ways of uh, eating uh, because of the richness in uh, unprocessed product, in fresh product that is actually uh, uh, rotating every day, you know, my my memories from childhood being in Spain is my mom going to the market every day and coming back with a basket full of different things that every day were slightly different in color. You know, even the tomatoes never were the same color or even the aubergines were never the same size or color. So that kind of diversity of fresh produce that is associated with the uh, way people eat around the Mediterranean is associated with diversity, with a better 
barrier function, and we talked about barriers as part of the immune system. And also it's associated with beta immune function because there's a, a good balance between tolerance and inflammation. So there's a, you know, like in any relationship, you have to have a, a certain amount of tolerance for somebody. You need to tolerate them uh, uh, as opposed to just, uh, just be um, irated by them. So, you know, and, and in some cases, it's just very easy. You tolerate people very well and you get along with them very, very nicely. In some cases, you need to make an effort. And the immune system and our environment uh, it is a little bit like that as well. So if everything is going tickety-boo, then there's tolerance and inflammation in perfect balance. And the, uh, uh, the Treg and the Th17 sites of the immune system, which are uh, uh, needed to work in balance, so we don't go into an autoimmune kind of a situation, or we don't overreact to 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 environmental pressures. Uh, that that's perfect in a kind of uh, 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 an ideal situation where we eat in plenty of uh, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and whole grains and seafood and so on. If we go into the Western diet kind of model of eating, we find carbohydrates and refined uh, saturated fat and so on and loads of supermarket foods that are uh, so rich in, in in ingredients that we don't even know how to pronounce and and they last months uh, on a shelf they might actually impair the permeability of the gut causing this thing called leaky gut and most importantly we might actually lose the tolerance so we might actually react more readily to um to uh, environmental pressures and environmental pressures also also uh, capture dietary pressures which is why people might actually develop allergies and sensibilities and so on more sensibilities that, than actually allergies full-blown allergies so toxic byproducts can be actually um, um, manufactured by the cells in your um, in your gut and they could do that, you know, you have some pathogens or opportunistic bacteria like the Cytobacter or the Klebsiella making, uh, giving you access to this LPS rich structure that surrounds them. There's going to be a response, there's going to be a, a, a stress response or a defense response by the immune system that leads to inflammation locally. And uh, same thing if you have uh, potentially some uh, 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 toxins uh, uh, that are coming from um, uh, dietary patterns that are, you know, full of these, um, um, uh, again, ingredients that you cannot even pronounce and, and that they may not be toxic as in they won't kill you, but they are interpreted by the body in a way that is not the same as when you eat a, a fresh produce from just straight from the from a, um, a vegetable garden. And that again, it's, it's going to generate a, a defense response by the, by the system, by the your, um, immune system, and it's going to lead to, to inflammation. And then there's also a really well-known situation where your uh, good bacteria actually breaks bad. So you have your symbiotic bacteria, which are the ones that give you uh, uh, really uh, good health benefits. So you have your, your lactobacillus, your bifidobacteria, and so on. But they can actually be uh, um, um, bothered. They can be annoyed by either uh, antibiotics or um, um, things like ibuprofen or aspirin uh, that actually affect the, the balance of uh, uh, pH in the stomach because they alter the enzymes that are responsible for the uh, production of um, um, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So they will alter the overall pH of the gut and uh, there's going to be a, 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 some alkalinity in the gut, which is a fertile ground for alkaline loving um, microbes, which do not tend to be health giving. They are um, uh, the opposite of the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, fecalobacterium and so on, which actually like an, an acidic environment. So there's such a thing as well, as you know, I'm very passionate about the connection between the gut and the brain, being a neuroscientist. And uh, uh, I find really interesting this connection between uh, uh, immunity and, 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 and brain things, neuroimmunity. And there's such a thing as that, that um, top down kind of a connection where the brain actually is sending signals to the gut, uh, do not make too much mucus. So, you know, do not um, um, do not move so much. Do actually para it paralyzes stress that fight or flight response, 
uh, paralyzes the, the the normal functioning of the gut. So you end up with problems. You could end up, you know, go to the toilet too many times, or you could end up having a little bit of a constipation problem if you're stressed out. So there is that gut and brain uh, connection that um, um, allows us to to get a little bit more into the uh, relationship between the immune system, the microbiota, and, and mood disorders like depression, for example, which are down to an impaired um, kind of a feedback mechanism between the gut and the brain and an increased pro-inflammatory profile. So we have more inflammation in, in that kind of communication system, which is the, the gut-brain axis and the, the nerves communicating the gut and the brain. And that um, refers to inflammation, but it also refers to any other mood disorders as well. So we have this similar, very similar picture in anxiety and, and other uh, 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 disorders like neurodevelopmental disorders as well as uh, just um, behavioral uh, and uh, mood disorders. So your uh, lifestyle will have a, a, a really big role. And this is what I tend to say to people as well who say, I eat a really good diet, but if you are... Um, um, not sleeping well, if you're really stressed all the time, if you're working 16 hours a day, then it's not, um, it's not unusual to find that you will have uh, a, a lack of anti-inflammatory power and that the inflammatory uh, um, profile in your body is going to be heightened. And that is, um, if we start tying that into the gut, uh, we can see LPS popping up in there. So we have LPS as lipopolysaccharide. We have these cytokines, which are uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, like little hormone-like substances that um, um, communicate uh, uh, inflammation within that kind of uh, uh, mucus layer. And uh, and we have hundreds of papers you know all of the papers on the you know stop the video post the video and actually go and and find the reference there uh, most of them are, are free to access um i love visuals that are available for everybody uh, democratizing access to science is one of my goals and uh, you will find the references all uh, in the presentation so hope you find them useful so atlas used to have a, a very interesting profile uh, well, it still has uh, that profile uh, for only for professionals, only for doctors, researchers, uh, clinicians with a, a clinic um, with patients, clients. Uh, and in that um, uh, um, version of the ATLAS test, uh, we list all of the potential um, uh, culprits in terms of our LPS production. So Cytobacter, uh, your senior, Brevio, Salmonella, Pseudomonas, all of these kind of uh, opportunistic uh, pathogenic bacteria that you don't want to have too much of because they could actually uh, pose a problem. So uh, after uh, months of work and, and, and wanting to, to bring this to everybody, uh, which was one of my goals when I joined Atlas, I... Uh, um, uh, I am very pleased to share with you that we have that same kind of capability for everybody, whether you are professional or whether you just have an Atlas test and you're um, uh, just um, a, a regular member of the lovely general public. So you have your list of bacteria that you can access from your um, Atlas test as, as usual, but you also have a... Um, an interesting report uh, from the nutrition section in your dashboard. You go into inflammation and the microbiome and you have a description and you can start seeing the same kind of things that we've been talking about, how lipopolysaccharides uh, in gram-negative bacteria such as Klebsiella and Cytobacter might actually um, contribute to a, a, a higher uh, pro-inflammatory uh, index or um, 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 score, so to speak, a profile. And... Uh, so we take a look at your beneficial bacteria as well as your opportunistic or pathogenic bacteria that might be contributing to inflammation and try to figure out the balance between the two. So uh, um, the ba beneficial bacteria that we look at are a number of different bacteria such as your lactic acid bacteria and bifidobacteria. So your bifidobacterium, lactobacillus uh, and so on. Some 
also have very unique characteristics like your Atlacruzia or Barnesiella or Xalobacter. They will do different things. They will extract um, antioxidants from soy, for example, in the um, case of Atlacruzia or um, uh, Oxalobacter will allow you to metabolize oxalates from things like kale and spinach, for example. And so very cute, um, very specialized uh, um, microbes. And then you have some of those that are uh, incredibly useful for um, prevention of obesity and weight gain, for example, but not only just that. So uh, uh, Germantia, for example, has been studied in clinical trials for that uh, purpose. And, and scientists were gutted, uh, pun intended, that it actually didn't make people lose weight. But what it did was to regulate the uh, sensitivity to insulin, for example, making them a lot uh, more um, efficacious in uh, their blood sugar response, for example. And chrysanthemella is a very interesting bug because we have... Uh, we either have it or we don't have it. It's very difficult to grow if you haven't got the seed in there and the seed comes from vaginal birth. So if your mom gave you a vaginal birth as opposed to a C-section birth, then that uh, has a higher chance of being passed on from your mom to, to you. So, and, and so we look at uh, all of those and, and very, very, very important the probiotic bacteria that produce short chain fatty acids. So we have a look at those in previous uh, sections of the um, um, uh, webinar, just as the other acronym, uh, SCFA, as you will see a lot in different papers and blogs and so on. And, and most importantly, even though we have uh, various different short chain fatty acids like butyrate, acetate, propionate, valerate, and so on, we uh, butyrate is not only the, the best research one um, of, of them all. So um, um, plentiful literature documenting the benefits of butyrate. It's also known to feed your, um, uh, the cells in the gut lining. So if you go back to uh, um, one of those um, uh, representations of the gut lining, let me just go back to the physiology of the gut lining. Then we have the intestinal epithelial cells. They are hungry, they need to eat and, and butyrate feeds them. So you see those little arms that, uh, that they have extending up. They will be very porous and butyrate is waxy, it's kind of like oily and it fits right in there and actually nourishes the uh, cells. It gives them energy. And that's a very important uh, function of butyrate. So it's used and most of it's actually used just um, uh, very locally to um, feed the um, cells in the gut lining. So that's uh, the butyrate, really incredibly important. And uh, then if you have a look at that butyrate and, uh, and, and we do that for you, so we have a look at butyrate, it's in your reports, and we have a look at the bugs that actually allow you to produce butyrate and you see the those involved. So you have, Fecalobacterium, Rosaburia, you have um, uh, Butyrococcus, you have Eubacterium halley, a whole group that is incredibly important, uh, Butyvivrio as well. So you have all of those microbes actually um, contributing to how much butyrate you produce. You can track it over time. You have your reports um, that will give you this kind of graphs that I've presented in uh, uh, in this section in here. And with that, alongside the um, 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 uh, analysis of your uh, bacteria that produce LPS, we, again, we do the yin and yang for you. you we compare how many and how varied is your, how wide and how varied is your colony of uh, bacteria that produce LPS versus the bacteria that produce butyrate specifically for you. And we present it to you in different ways. So whether you're, uh, you know, you uh, just uh, just bought a test, you're not a doctor or a researcher or a nutritionist, you just bought a test and you see something like this in your raw data section of the, um, um, anti-inflammatory potential report, you'll see the bacteria that for you actually are contributing to that anti-inflammatory potential broken down by percentage of your of representation in your microbiome, as well as 
those that decrease the anti-inflammatory potential. So they literally are more inflammatory. So we do that, the sum for you, we do the kind of like comparison between the two. And we present you with an inflammation and the microbiome report, a really interesting index that goes from one to 10. And you, I can see if you do a test, so if you do uh, a test and you change something and uh, you know you do a test, you have a certain type of diet and you want to see what happens when you, um, when you change it to uh, another type of diet. And not everybody has a crappy diet and then they change it to the perfect diet. It could be little bits that you change. So it doesn't need to be a dramatic change, but by testing and retesting, you have the ability to see that uh, over time, things can change, not just in the traditional way of presenting your lactobacilli with the bacteria and so on, but also your uh, um, anti-inflammatory potential. So you realize this anti-inflammatory potential by doing various different things, whether it's just introducing a new way of eating, eating more varied um, grains, eating more varied pulses, um, you know, taking some um, supplements, for example. So vitamin D recently has been shown as uh, being a contributor to uh, diversity in the microbiome. So vitamin D supplements actually help the diversity of the microbiome. Might they help your anti-inflammatory potential, perhaps? And uh, that would be an interesting experiment for you to try and, and, and do um, with, uh, you know, a before and after kind of situation. So it is important uh, to look at these kind of things as well, because it allows us uh, behind the scenes at Atlas to give you uh, recommendations that are uh, insightful and meaningful uh, uh, for you specifically. So we all know that fruit and vegetables are good for everybody. This is kind of a, you know, World Health Organization kind of advice. You cannot go wrong with it. But what about specific things? What about, you know, um, when you, we, we, we are told we need to eat more fiber, but what, what types of fiber specifically? So we break it down and we give you some recommendations without being prescriptive because Atlas will not give you a diet or a meal plan. We have nutritionists that you can book a consultation with and I encourage you to do that and actually explore different aspects of your test with if you um, um, are willing to do that. A very useful kind of consultation. But we don't give you a, a meal plan. It's not a Monday to Sunday kind of a menu. What we do is to take into account um, all of this data that I've shown you before and hundreds more pages. So this is just a snippet of the kind of uh, percentages and, uh, and numbers that we look at and representation of different bacteria and then give you recommendations based on that. So if we tell you that you need cocoa or um, even dark chocolate in your diet, that would be good for you. It's not whimsical, it's not to humor you because we know that people like chocolate, it's because we know that, for example, when we give you recommendations, if cocoa is there, it's because we know that it's uh, high cocoa flavonols are, have been seen clinically to um, um, regulate the, uh, um, the immune system by changing the balance of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, these kind of molecules that I mentioned before. And uh, lactobacilli and bifidobacteria happen to have a role in that. So when we give you these recommendations and say, you might want to eat some cocoa because it's actually very interesting for your lactobacilli, it's because it's actually um, uh, rooted in science. And all of these recommendations that we give you, again, and so here we see the cocoa, you know, and uh, it's not whimsical. It's not just because it's good for you. It, you know, it, there's a base for it that is applied to you specifically. The same thing with dairy. So when we recommend that people have a dairy or a dairy alternative um, a drink, for example, like a well, kefir or, um, you know, a fermented uh, um, a milk or milk alternative is because of the diversity of uh, uh, microbes that will uh, be in, in those drinks or in those fermented foods like kefir and yogurt and so on. So really interesting recommendations that, that again, it's not just because it's good for you, it's because it makes sense to you. So it's always going to be insight, an insight into, into, into your own microbiome, which is what we strive to do as a personalized health company. So 
because nothing stays the same forever, then testing and retesting is always going to be a really, really uh, interesting strategy. And uh, uh, if you're new to testing, I would advise doing a test uh, every three months. Um, if you're doing things to, to merit that, that, that investment, obviously, because if you're just not doing anything new, unless you're really super motivated to learn around uh, about your health, then, you know, uh, absolutely, I, I would encourage you to do that. But uh, even more, if you're making some changes, so if, uh, if you have a goal, whether it's to lose weight or to, to be more alert or to improve your skin or whatever it is, if you're making changes that involve changing your dietary routine or doing more exercise or changing the type of exercise or you know you could have the perfect diet already you think i have the absolutely perfect diet but i still have some niggles whatever it is then you know this is the situation that if you're new to gut testing do it every three months and uh and explore the changes because that's uh, a really good um um exercise of collecting insights about yourself that are going to help you in the future and then start discontinuing or uh, uh, you know uh, making the time uh, the frequency longer so instead of doing it every three months you do it every six months so once a year and so on but initially i think it's a really good thing to do at least a couple to uh, to see the before and after and a third one always gives you that reassurance that whatever ha you have been doing, it's 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 actually staying there. And then if you uh, engage with it, absolutely, you know, uh, I would encourage everybody to to do that first year of you know a, a kit every three months just to get you going. And to help you to do that, um, uh, I've created a code. It's immune thirty, immune thirty. Uh, Put it in the um, checkout at uh, atlasbiomed.com uh, and it will give you an instant 30% off your kits. Um, so that is uh, uh, a treat for you from me. Enjoy. I uh, hope that you will be able to uh, get a couple of, uh, uh, at least a couple of kits to, to get you going with that uh, really generous discount. And uh, I also wanted to share before uh, we finish with nearly, very, very, very nearly done, that there are a couple of uh, 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 um, different features and where to locate them. So we've been talking about this uh, um, uh, inflammation report, very important inflammation report. So we talked about the inflammation and the microbiome and the anti-inflammatory potential index that you uh, see on the screen. So uh, again, if once you get your test, so don't forget the new 30 uh, code, then you can uh, uh, get your results. And um, in the nutrition section of the dashboard, uh, you click on nutrition and you get a number of different areas. You get your probiotics, you get your inflammation and the microbiome, you see it there, you see your microbiome type and, uh, I'll talk about these things in other uh, webinars because there's so much to talk about the test uh, that um, it would, it we'd be speaking for hours. So I'll, I'll chunk it down into various different sections and, uh, and, and sessions. But you also have another couple which are very important and I'll, I'll go into in another uh, webinar to just uh, give them some uh, uh, proper air time. We have some lactose intolerance and gluten intolerance uh, reports that are uh, very, very uh, important. So you have um, the lactose intolerance has a genetic component as does gluten intolerance, but also a microbial component. So you could be genetically uh, susceptible to um, have lactose intolerance because your genes actually mean that you produce uh, less lactase so you break down lactose less efficiently and that means that you could react to it so you could have more bloating and you know diarrhea and these kind of things same with gluten you could have a, a haplotype a, a group of genes that actually determine whether you have more or less susceptibility to gluten intolerance but then your microbes are really really important and you know geneticists always say your genes are probably responsible for 20% of, of whatever you're going to experience in life, whatever condition, and 80% is the environment. Well, the environment actually includes, as I said a couple of times already, it includes your microbes, it includes your, 
your 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 gut microbes and and depending on the configuration of those gut microbes those genes are actually going to be switched on or off so even if you have a high susceptibility to being gluten intolerant or lactose intolerant genetically that will be dampened down by the presence of different bacteria and i'll go into this in another session thank you so much for watching the webinar i hope that you enjoyed it and uh, i hope to see you very soon at another session take care of yourselves all the best goodbye